The final depositional setting that we're going to cover in our parade of coastal environments is the barrier island system. Living in California, we don't get to see barrier islands that much, but they're very widespread on modern coasts around the world, including the Atlantic coast, the Gulf coast of, of the U.S. Barrier islands don't include that many new depositional sub-environments. We've covered most of the components that you're going to see in previous videos, but in the barrier island they can be combined in slightly different ways, and there's interesting um, behavior of the when these uh, systems migrate. So a barrier island complex is a, is a complicated mosaic of sub-environments. It includes typical beach and shore face settings. There's a lagoon or a tidal flat behind the island, and tidal inlets and flood tidal, ebb tidal deltas cutting through the barrier island. I'll focus mostly on the tidal inlet and tidal, delta, tidal deltas in this video, uh, because the beach environment and the tidal environment, for example, should already, already be pretty familiar to you. The development of barrier islands is really a function of the coastal gradient. They tend to form when the coastal sh kind of shelf is, is quite shallow, or, or shallowly sloping, uh, likely why they're not very common in California. And their morphology, however, particularly the spacing and the size of the tidal inlets and the continuity of the islands, varies with the tidal range. So microtidal coastlines, which are ones where there's the tidal range less than two meters, the tidal range is the difference between the elevation difference between low and, and high tide. Macrotidal coastlines have a tidal range greater than four meters, and mesotidal coastlines are intermediate, at two to four meter tidal range. So just to show some examples, uh, here's a, a microtidal barrier island in Texas. You can see that the islands are very continuous. They're only broken by very widely spaced and rare tidal inlets. You know, there's nearly 75 kilometers between the two tidal limits that I've indicated here. The area behind the barrier, the back barrier as it's sometimes called, is, is dominated by, it's a lagoon here, it's an, that's an area of quiet water, open water, you know, it's likely fine-grained sediments because it's low energy, it's protected from the waves. So here's a more mesotidal coastline, and in these the barrier islands are more con discontinuous, the tidal inlets are larger and they're more closely spaced. The back barrier region is dominated by tidal flats, not by lagoons here, again because of the somewhat higher tidal range. And as the tidal range increases even more, the islands, the barriers themselves, become very small and very widely spaced. The reason for this is that when the tidal range is high, a, a, a huge volume of water needs to be moved from the open ocean to behind the barriers and back again every 12 hours with the tidal cycle. And so to move that huge volume of water, there needs to be a lot of very large tidal inlets just so it, has, it can actually physically move through the area. A lot of modern barrier islands occur on transgressive coastlines, so a lot of facies models assume retrogradational facies stacking. But that's not necessarily the case. Here's an example from the modern of a prograding barrier island complex. The arid tidal flat in the back and the, the barrier island, you can see the the modern beach, but the ridges behind it are former beach ridges as the barrier island has prograded outwards. A lot of ancient barrier islands known from the rock record are also progradational. So we'll start with microtidal coastlines. On, on these, the islands are rarely overtopped by high tides. Only a small volume of water needs to be moved in and out of the lagoon, so tidal channels are few and far between. Wave processes like storm washover lobes and flood tidal deltas are, are what dominate instead. We discussed washover lobes in the uh, estuaries video, but they're also an important depositional process on barrier islands, especially on these microtidal islands where storms are the dominant sediment transport process. In this, the storm surge crests over the island in big storms, particularly hurricanes and storms like that, and deposits a thin lobe or sheet of sand in the, into the back barrier or even into the lagoon environment. The sand sheet will thin towards the lagoon, likely to be pretty high energy sand, maybe planar laminations, and will interfinger with the lagoon sediments, just like we discussed interfingering of the washover with the um, central basin sediments in an estuary. So on a mesotidal uh, coastline, as I mentioned, the tidal range is greater, so more water must be moved past the barrier during each tidal cycle. And as a result, the tidal inlets are numerous, 
tidal currents dominate the sediment transport much more so than waves. So in this tidal inlet and tidal delta complex, there is a flood tidal delta, which is on the lagoon side or the back barrier side of the islands. It's composed of subaqueous dunes and sandbars that form as the incoming flood tidal current spreads out and decelerates in the lagoon. The flood tidal delta forms a significant portion of the lagoon deposits that have really high preservation potential in the rock record. Like in estuaries, the tidal inlet in a barrier island is deep, erosive-based, high-energy channel. Um, it you know, features large dune structures. We'll talk about them in, in the next slide in a little bit more detail. The ebb tidal delta, which you can see kind of under the water on the ocean side of the barrier island, just on the other side of the, the channel, um, it's, uh, it's formed when the outgoing ebb tidal current spreads and, and decelerates. Like the flood tidal delta, the ebb tidal delta is composed of large subaqueous dunes. However, it's often reworked by shore face erosion as either the coastline transgresses or as the island migrates later, or as the, as the as the inlet migrates laterally. Um, so as a result, the ebb tidal delta typically has very low preservation potential in the rock record. You're, you know, the, the dunes that are present there are unlikely to leave sedimentary structures in the record because they're going to be reworked by shore face erosion in particular. So in the tidal inlet, the incoming flood current enters on the edges and tends to be strongest along the margins of the channel, the, the light yellow arrows going, going into the, the back barrier area. It exits kind of straight into the lagoon and then spreads as a plume over the flood tidal delta. The outgoing ebb current is kind of the mirror image. It enters from the lagoon at the margins, but then flows um, you know, deep through the channel, uh, rapidly through the channel base, and continues out through the ebb tidal delta. So the flood tidal delta, which as I said has very good preservation potential, comprises a lot of the sediment in the, in the lagoon, is mainly composed of these large planar cross beds, this flood ramp. The base of it can be ebb channel deposits as the ebb currents flow around the side or and out the, the inlet. And there can be some ebb directed smaller cross beds as on the shield as the water is flowing around the tidal delta on the way out. The tidal inlet migrates laterally, um, so it tends to grade upwards from high energy, probably planar trough bed, cross beds. And, the, and these cross beds at the base overlying the erosive channel base are dominantly ebb directed. It's a tidal channel, so they're, they're tidal inlet, so they're bi directional, but the ebb current will dominate at the bottom part of the tidal inlet as the ebb current flows rapidly out the channel base. And then as the channel migrates laterally and deposits upwards in the section, the shallower channel parts tend to be more flood-directed cross beds, still bi-directional, but with a more dominant flood direction. And finally, at the top, there are beach sediments with typical beach facies, low-angle laminations, and ultimately, aeolian dunes, typically on the barrier island. So as I mentioned briefly, uh, these tidal inlets in barrier islands migrate laterally. That's due primarily to longshore sediment supply. Because the sediment is supplied by longshore drift on, on one side of the lagoon, it tends to erode on the other side and therefore migrate in, in that direction. In a wave-dominated or microtidal barrier, this inlet is kind of shallow and it tends to migrate quite rapidly. In a tide-dominated barrier island, when these more mesotidal settings, the inlets are deep and migrate much more slowly. But regardless of, of how fast they migrate, they both produce lateral accretion-like surfaces, somewhat analogous to meandering point bars. The geometry of that lateral accretion channel deposit will differ because of the balance between aggradation and lateral migration in these, in these different settings, kind of analogous to what we talked about with river um, lateral migration and, and aggradation. So just like in wave-dominated estuaries, transgressive barrier islands can generate ravinement surfaces both in the tidal inlet, in the erosive-based tidal channel, uh, and in the shore-face setting. 
the tidal inlet ravine will erode through flood tidal deltas or the lagoon or back uh, barrier tidal flat sediments or potentially even deeper into the section. The shore face wave ravine nearly always removes the beach and the aeolian dune facies. These barrier islands have, you know, often have aeolian sand dunes on top of them, but they almost never make it into the rock record just because of, of shore face erosion. So again, the last video I introduced the transgressive ravinement surface, the fifth and final uh, sequence stratigraphic surface that we're going to be discussing. Uh, but it can also occur in barrier islands, and again, it separates the overlying transgressive systems tract from underlying regressive facies. So it's a sequence stratigraphic surface because it separates systems tracts. So just like in the wave-dominated estuaries, these ravinement surfaces in, in transgressive barrier islands can be the transgressive ravinement surface. But note that not all ravinement surfaces are true sequence stratigraphic surfaces. The diagram shows a, a combination of, of tidal ravinement rates and shore face ravinement rates. Um, the upper row is, is, has no tidal ravinement, only shore face, and the bottom row has very, very deep tidal ravinement. And as you go left to right, the amount of shore face ravinement increases. So in the diagram, the red surfaces, the red erosional surfaces, are the transgressive ravinement surface. They're a sequence stratigraphic surface because the underlying deposits are older regressive deposits and the overlying deposits are transgressive systems track deposits. All of the light blue ravinement surfaces, however, have transgressive deposits both above and below them, so they don't separate systems tracks and therefore they're not a sequence stratigraphic surface. They're instead called within-trend surfaces because they occur within a single shore face trend, a transgressive trend in this case. And so you either get the within-trend wave ravinement surface or the within-trend tidal ravinement surface, or in fact you can get both of them.